Hey, what is happening all you globe tards out there? It's Jack Rowland, recording from the confines of my bedroom, which has become my quarantine cave. Welcome to In Too Deep. I hope you're all hanging in there and staying at home, catching up on all your binge watching to keep the boredom at bay. A few things I've recently watched that I can't recommend enough. Uh, Tiger King, obviously. That shit is just fucking crazy. I watched Parasite the other night. What a hectic film that is. Really enjoyed that one. Um, Contagion. That film should seriously just be renamed 2020 The Movie. Um, It's definitely not what you should be watching right now, but also watch it right now. Tim and Eric have a new sitcom parody called Beef House on Adult Swim. I love everything those guys do. And the most important recommendation of all would be Behind the Curve on Netflix. This documentary is a look into the world of the Flat Earth community. The film is mainly centered around one prominent Flat Earther named Mark Sargent, who has kind of become one of the spokespeople for the movement. His YouTube videos, Flat Earth Clues, have been a large contributor to the growing number of Flat Earthers and have made him a bit of a celebrity within the community. I had a lot of fun talking to Mark, and I would like to invite you all into the world of conspiracy theories as I dive back into the deep waters of the Flat Earth Theory. Is there a point to all this? I think we're getting in too deep. You don't apply. Bad luck. Well, I have one speed, I have one gear. Go! I'll tell you when we're getting in too deep, too deep, too deep, too deep, 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 deep. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very well. My name is Jack. So thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah. And welcome to Into Deep, which I think the uh, the title is uh, very fitting for this subject matter. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, so I'm coming from you from Melbourne, Australia. <clears throat> Sorry, bad time of the year to have a cough right now. I was I was just I was in <clears throat> Melbourne in the uh, in the fall. Oh, good. So I don't have to ask I- you if you believe Australia is fake or not. Then. <laughs> oh no no, it's a real place. I good, did good. a um. I did a television commercial for a company of yours down there called um, Sportsbet. Oh, yep, yep. I know Sportsbet. Haven't had much to do with yeah. it, but yep. So, <laughs> what was so the we did a, there was a campaign they did called Foolproof, and uh, they, they brought me down for it, and I was the only non-actor that they brought in, which I thought was kind of fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're a prominent flat earther, probably possibly one of the most prominent ones um, that's kind of circulating around there. Is it fair to say that you're kind of a, uh, a full-blown conspiracy theorist in a broader sense, as in uh, Flat Earth may be where you're at now, but there's probably a lot of other conspiracy theories that you subscribe to? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was into a lot of different conspiracies, but I didn't necessarily call myself a, a tinfoil hat type of guy. I just had an opinion on just right. about every conspiracy you could think of. And then once I got into Flat Earth, everything else became second tier, mm-hmm. second shelf. I just didn't uh, I just didn't care as much because Flat Earth was so big and so encompassing that that's really where I focused my efforts. Right. So um, are there any conspiracy theories that you might uh, actually say you think are bullshit? Just like, that's wacky, that, no, nah, don't buy it. Uh, it really runs the gamut. I mean, there's some, you know, my, some of my favorites would be, um, 9-11, Pearl Harbor, JFK, the moon landings, ones that I, that I like, um, others, you know, did, did Elvis have Bigfoot's baby? Probably not. (laughs) Um, but, but at the same time, you know, you know, could there be dinosaurs swimming around Loch Ness? Uh, I'm not going to completely shoot it down. The thing is, because once you get into flat earth, it opens up your mind for a whole bunch of other things. It makes you revisit a lot of other conspiracies. Hmm. So the criteria I usually give for any good conspiracy is, would I do it myself or would I have done it any differently than the powers that be? I put myself in their shoes mm-hmm. and I say, okay, d- you know, why were they doing it? Were they doing it for the greater good? And would I have done it the same way? And if I would have done it the same way, then yeah, you know, it's that's legit my book. I'd, I'd like uh, and because I'll tell people I'll go, yeah, this is why this conspiracy is happening. It's not because of a, a super horrible, sinister side of things. It's because you know powers that be make decisions for the greater good sometimes. Right. Okay. Interesting. Um, what's the gateway theory that kind of led you in? I'm um, my 
kind of, uh, you know, following the breadcrumbs of what would lead someone down the flat earth rabbit hole, uh, as far as I can trace it, it seems to um, end, so to begin with the, the moon landing is fake theory. Would that be right. fair to say? That That's one of them, sure. Um, the moon landing is definitely a litmus test that we throw at people. Uh, if you, especially in this country, it's really weird because, you know, it's a home team type of thing. So uh, yeah, for yeah. Americans, it you know, it's, it's not considered necessarily sacrilege anymore because it's been two generations since the moon landing. Uh, but yeah, if you believe, I mean, you, in fact, I talked to a a woman the other day who, um, is an astrophysicist (laughs) and she goes, don't you dare bring up the moon landings (laughs) to me. And and I'm going, why not? That's where we start. Yeah. 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 (laughs) You know, if if we, we have to go after the moon landings because they have not aged well. Um, for me, that wasn't the gateway, uh, the moon landings, because the moon landings have been talked about the United States for ever since the mid seventies. Right. You know, ever since we shut down the moon program in 1972, people way before the Internet, people were walking, you know, nerds, especially, you know, mm. going, hey, the math doesn't really work on this. And, you know, they're doing all sorts of fun calculations. They're saying there's something wrong. Uh, for me, it was the um, the hollow earth theory. That's what hollow got me into it. Uh, right. Is hollow that earth. like a David Icke kind of territory? Eh, kind of. Yep. Kind of. It, 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 you know, that there could be civilizations living beneath us. Yeah. Which wasn't that one. much of a wasn't much of a stretch for me and when i was looking into it that's when i saw that's when i ran into admiral bird you know the united states navy guy who spent most of his career in antarctica you know that's that's the part that kind of led me there hmm. because i was looking at you know he was supposedly flew to the um, the north pole in 1926 and the the myth goes that he found you know some hollow earth entrance you know journey yeah, to the center of the earth yeah. type and I thought, oh, okay, well, that's pretty cool. Where does that lead? It didn't lead anywhere. Um, it led to Antarctica. They were the United States military just sent him out in 1928 to Antarctica. And that's where the, he spent his the rest of his entire career was hmm. flying around in freaking circles out there looking for something. And that's that's what you know, led me down the path. So that would be a hollow earth theory would kind of, would that contradict um, the flat earth theory? Like no, earth no, theory no. It, revised, it, or? It dovetails pretty well. Um, I didn't think it would in the beginning, but uh, here's the thing. Most people don't realize how little we need as a civilization to survive, how much space. Mm. Because like, you know, 95% of of our civilization lives between sea level and only one mile up, you know, 5,000 feet, give or take. And so what if you had a cavern that was 10 miles high? That's as high as airline travel. 20 miles high would be as high as spy planes. So even if you had a cavern that was 50, 100 miles high, you could put a civilization in there very, very comfortably, hmm. which then leads to the question that's like, how do you know we're not in one of those right now? Yeah. You know, how, how, how do we know we're not subterranean? So that kind of, um, would that kind of explain why you've settled on the, uh, the glow dome kind of model of a flat earth? Because it seems like there's a lot of uh, disagreements within the flat earth community at least that i've kind of noticed of what yeah. it is that we're actually on <clears throat> i settled on the dome side of things mostly because of well one because of the ancient cosmology references just about every culture drew a snow globe right. back in the day i mean that that seemed pretty easy um and i'm not going to say that i got into it because of the biblical side of things the whole firmament you know from genesis type type deal um, for me, it was an, an air pressure thing because how would we design, uh, if, how would we build it now? And we would always build it with some sort of dome uh, if we were going to build one ourselves. Again, the Truman Show, which is, you know, you build build a, basically a, a sports stadium, a covered stadium 20 miles wide. How many people could you put in there and how many people could you trick? And the funny thing about Truman Show is you, one person, please, mm. <laughs> you could have put a thousand kids in there. And yeah. as long as, you know, they were all, you know, not itching to go explore, you, you'd you probably be doing pretty well. Um, and the dome thing worked out pretty well for us, um, mostly because of the air pressure issue. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, for so, and most of the, the flat earth community goes with the dome side of things. There's at least... Uh, 25 30 percent that don't go with dome mm. they, they just but most of that is a personal preference most of that's because they don't want to um uh they don't like being fenced in right. they don't like it's like you know they, they become claustrophobic it's like it's <laughs> like man there shouldn't be any limits 
you know, it should be all free. We should be free, man. It's like, come on. Do you think it's that's like, interesting it, how people will uh, decide what they think the earth is based on their kind of, I guess, subconscious, some subconscious preferences of how they yeah. want it to be? I mean, yeah, do, yeah, do, yeah. do you ever question your motive about the, the globe, um, the snow dome thing? Is that, is that how you want it to be? or No, no, not so much because I, I don't really have a, a personal preference. So like some people said, well, you're you know, turning the, the solar system into a one room apartment, you know, like a studio apartment. I go, yeah, but it's a really nice studio apartment. It's, it's pretty good. It's quite well, quite well appointed. Mm. So uh, for no, for me, it's it's quite big enough. And qu even if it was enclosed, um, no, I have no, no, I have no personal stake in it. It's just like, look, it's well designed. I mean, the thing is very, very well designed. So I'm not going to, you know, look a gift horse in the mouth. Mm. You know, it's like it's like it's like getting a new BMW. Right. You know, right, right, right. Pe people can complain and ha having somebody complain because it doesn't have a sunroof or yeah. it does have a sunroof. And it's like, what? You got it for free. What are you complaining about? <laughs> so I guess the kind of physical structure that we're on, um, that would be the general consensus for the flat earth theory would be a flat uh, plane. Uh, so yeah. kind of the, uh, I think in the, the documentary there's um, that you're in, which is behind the curve, there's many illustrations of this. Um, yes. So it's kind of the map that we see it is more kind of curved around, North Pole being in the center, uh, South right. Pole being a huge ice wall around the edge. G give or take, but we don't even really call it an ice wall. Um, the ice wall was kind of picked up by the media, mostly because of Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> didn't do it didn't do us a lot of favors right. um the other move the other movie that didn't do us any favors was thor because of it. the whole cos the whole cosmic waterfall you know because asgard was this flat disc that was basically just sitting in space right you know in this other dimension with the water con constantly falling off and people said why doesn't the water fall, fall off and it's like for the same reason it doesn't fall off you know when you're in a lake Right. It's because it's surrounded on all sides. And what I try to tell people, I go, don't think of it like a snow globe or, or something with an ice wall around it. You're in a building with mm. walls and a floor and a ceiling. And it's really, really big. And inside this building is a giant saltwater lake. And, you know, where the Antarctic, where the, the, the one of the biggest misconceptions is where Antarctica starts, you know, the, the coastline of Antarctica, that that probably goes in thousands of miles past what we have on any maps, including our own, the one that the Flat Earth puts out there. Um, one of my friends says, you really, if you're going to do TV things, you really should have the white part of the Antarctica be really much, much bigger. I go, yeah, but I can't fit it into my suitcase if, if, I, <laughs> if I make it that big. Yeah. So, so I suppose what you're kind of putting forward is more just a conceptual il illustration rather than this is how it is. Say it, say it one more time. Sorry. I said, I, I guess what you guys are putting out there, those images, is more of a conceptual illustration rather than... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's more conceptual than anything. In fact, one of, the, one of our drawbacks of the images that we put out there is the sun and the moon, for example, because people say, well, if, if the sun's right there like that, then you should be able to see it at, from everywhere at all times. And I go, yeah, that's not what the sun looks like. Unfortunately, the sun in our model is so small that because man it's about maybe 50 miles wide and you know the the maps that we show are twenty thousand miles wide so this thing would just be a, a pixel on this mm. on this thing so the only way we can even uh, illustrate the sun is to make it like almost a thousand miles wide right and and but then people look at it and go well it's freaking huge you can see it everywhere it's like yeah i know but that's because we can't make it any smaller because it was the size we say it is then you couldn't see it anyway you know from from that high up so what is uh, the sun but yeah Hmm? What is the sun then? What is it? Yeah. Oh, uh, the sun would be just basically an incandescent light bulb that's spinning above us like a mobile above a child's crib. And the moon would be a LED nightlight. An LED which, nightlight. Yeah, yeah, which is about the same size as the sun. And doesn't, and by the way, has no relationship to the sun really at all in terms of, you know, the, um, the reflective qualities. So when people say, oh, you know, the moon, it's getting its light because it's re being reflected off the sun. It's like, no, it's self-illuminated. Um, we can show this all day with point and click thermometers. And I didn't even think that was true. Again, work in progress where, um, you know, and I'm not going to convert it to um, Celsius for you. But so like it's uh, 80 degrees in the sun and it's 70 degrees in the shade because, you know, some whatever the object is blocks some of the sun rays. Well, if it's the moon, it's the exact opposite. Okay. And I didn't even think this was possible. I've tested it myself. So if it's 
50 degrees Fahrenheit in the moonlight, it's 60 degrees or warmer in the moon shade, up to 13 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. And it's like, okay, what does that prove? I go, it doesn't prove flat earth, but it blows away the, the relationship between the sun and the moon because you're basically, the sun is, gener I'm sorry, the moon is generating um, a cold laser light, which we can, we can actually replicate now. Um, I didn't even know that if you change the frequency on lasers, you can actually make them generate a cooling light, not, you know, you can't turn things into ice cubes instantly, obviously, but you can you can make it colder. So the question is, why is the moon giving off this light? How, the, how do you unless test you, that? Oh, oh, it's easy. Um, find any objects in the the you know wait till the the moon is high in the sky. Mm -hmm. Get a point and click. If you there's three different ways you could do this. Um, you could do a point and click infrared thermometer. Buy it at a local hardware store uh, for like twenty bucks. And um, they're usually used to test engine parts and asphalt and, and stuff like didn't even know what those damn things were for. Oh, coronavirus. And yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? You right could test them for yep. the virus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I bet you can't even buy them now because, yep. because they're being sold out. Um, I don't think they were necessarily meant for medical, though. I think it was more industrial. Mm. I think you can, well, who knows nowadays? People are probably buying them off the shelves anyway. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not medical. But if you point at the moonlight, and then you point at something in the moon's shade, um, you will see uh, this big temperature difference. Wouldn't there be um, a you can whole also... bunch of different varying factors, though, that would kind of... Uh, that oh, yeah, yeah. Not I, exactly I would have a thought controlled so. experiment. Oh, no, no. We've done the controlled experiment versions of this. I mean, you can do it, you know, just yourself, but you could also do it with um, glasses of water and, and copper strips with, you know, hooked up to temperature gauges. Um, you can do it with um, uh, one of the most recent guys. And there's some wonderful videos on this. Um, one of the guys that wasn't even ours, um, he was using um, Predator Vision uh, hmm. from, you know, photography. And he was showing, you know, the, the color patterns. He's going, yeah, look. And he didn't even know. It's like, holy smokes. And he just keeps going back and forth. And, um, the the one thing though which i thought was and I'll, I'll take credit for this one which was uh because i asked i go what happens if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight does it get warmer or does it get even colder it gets colder it even gets colder with magnified so we can do you can do moonshade moonlight and magnified moonlight and just move your way down the scale so you're saying if there's a full moon and you're getting yeah. the natural light from the full moon. You could get a magnifying yep. glass, kind of concentrate the light, and it will create a. Cool it'll even it'll generate it'll even get colder than the regular moonlight. Yeah, hmm. it's fascinating. I might now have, I might have to again test, test you on that one. You should. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's it's. I honestly, I had been into flat Earth for a year, and somebody called me up and told me this, and I go, "Get out of here!" <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm a flat earther. I'm going, "Get out! Mm. Get out! It's stupid." But again, does it prove a flat Earth? No, but it just destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Unless you, you know, some can explain somebody to me that the moon is actually converting the radiation from the sun and then making it negative, which mm. uh, defies physics as far as I know, because it's like shining a flashlight on your wall and cooling lettuce on the reflection. Right. It's it, it can't be done. But anyway, it's one of those five points. The scientists hate me bringing it up okay. because it's so it's so new. I haven't, like, haven't, that one's new to me. I have not have not heard that. I thought I'd uh... <laughs> it, again. People, it's people. I love human beings because we tend to do. Yeah, we do a lot of stupid stuff. But you, as you can imagine, like people, mo so many of our scientific things are done by accident anyway. Mm. And this is one of those things. It's like, oh, what happens? You know, they're pointing this thing at everything. Yep, and yep. That's what they found out. Anyway, well, if so, if these are just light bulbs, and I guess, do you have any idea what the the dome um would be made out of that would be above us holding us in is that like a glass uh, it's a plastic, kind of no a... no nah, nah, it's it's a dealer's choice to be sure but whatever it is is really 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 strong uh, you know because we were trying to bust through it the united states and soviet union for four years i mean really just trying to crank through that thing with atomic weapons and if you can't get through with something with some with megaton you're not getting through it where's so the, um, where's the proof of that Oh, high altitude nuclear testing. That's not secret information at all. But for four years, they for couldn't whatever get reason. They couldn't get through well, a they. The, let's put it this way. Tell me, give me a reason why the United States and Soviet Union for their atomic testing from 58 to 62 were firing no, only up. They didn't do ground tests. They didn't do water tests. They didn't do anything. They just kept firing up. Around the same time that you know Admiral Byrd supposedly figured out what, where where this place was, and again they were doing kind of one of the qualifiers of what I think is a conspiracy. It's like, look, if I would have done the same thing, it's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm on board with this. So if you all of a sudden find out in the late 50s 
because I should qual let me qualify another thing, which is if that this is one of those conspiracies that's actually relatively new compared mm -hmm. to other conspiracies. And yeah, it's an old theory, but what I'm saying is even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until almost 1960 because we just didn't have the tech to do it. We didn't even have decent planes until 50 years ago, you know? And so if you figured out in almost 1960, you know, that all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, the world isn't what we think it is. What, what's the first thing men would do? It's like, hey, there's a wall, get the cannon. You know, they're gonna try to bust through it and the cannons aren't working. It's like, what do we got? Just keep up in the, up in the ante. Yeah. And from, and that's what they, in the first couple shots, in fact, the first couple shots were brilliant because they were low, low megaton. And this was back in the day when megaton was a pricey proposition. And then everything else after that was medium kiloton range. And they just kept firing up and I knew exactly what they were doing. They were mapping out the sky. And it's like, okay, let's see what the demand, how else would you measure the dimensions of this damn thing? You just keep firing rockets up and detonate them, you know, crash some and detonate others until you get sort of a rough, kind of like paintballing it. How come there's no blemishes you know? on it? If they've been releasing, uh, smashing bombs on it, I don't know. Can you can you make a blemish on a unified field or an electromagnetic frequency or a heavy element or a heavy water? I don't know. Hmm. Whatever whatever it's made out of, though, it's better than us. It's, right, it's better than our stuff. And I, by the way, I don't think they've ever stopped trying. Okay, meaning after atomic weapons, they're like, well, the brute force isn't going to work. What else you got? Oh, you got this heart project, weather modification, but. Maybe we can, you know, tune it to something else. Like, that's not working. What else you got? Well, we're working on this CERN thing. You know, maybe we can just open up a doorway and go through and come out the other side. Why not? So you, th so, so you think that all these, I guess, the powers that be, the um, yeah. they're trying to figure it out. They didn't create it. They're, they're actually trying to work out how to get out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we we had, human, we had nothing to do with this at all. This predates us. This goes. This is straight out of. Um, uh, the movie Contact. One of the best lines, most humble lines in Contact was right film. when when she said, you know, did you make it? She, and, and he flat out said, he goes, we didn't make it. We don't know who did. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, you know, who made the system that she was flying through. And that's what I think we're, we're looking at here. You know, you go to our, our powers that be our highest government, be like, we have no idea. So this but isn't an what, Illuminati it, conspiracy. This is a... No, 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 no. Bigger, no, they, bigger than that. No, yeah, the Illuminati, they wish. The, uh, this is one of those things where the Illuminati um, is just uh, all, all any of the secret societies. And I don't, the uh, great thing about conspiracies is nobody knows who's the, who's the, the top dog. I mean, you ask yep. any conspiracy guy, it's like, is it the Bilderberg Council of Formulation? You know, uh, the Rothschilds, the Illuminati, the Vatican goes on and on and on. Yep. Um, if... It, the Illuminati and, and any of these groups, all they're trying to do, all they've been doing for the last 50, 60 years, is keeping it a secret. That's all they're doing. It's like, okay, we're going to hold on to this thing until we can figure out a way to introduce it to the public. Because if you would have told everybody in 1960, it wouldn't have gone over well. Uh, you know, you're, because the civilization's already been built. Civilization, you, that what might be one of your questions, which is like, why not tell people? Why keep it a secret? It's like, well, if you do, you're, you're, you know, civilization, the, the main structure, the main core of our civilization has been built for centuries. It's not what they have to gain from it. It's what they have to lose. So academically, all your physical sciences would have to be retooled. And that's every university in every country. That's a nightmare. Um, the economic markets, I mean, come on, <laughs> this little virus that's happening, <laughs> it's destroying the markets. You know, it's, it's all over the place. And that's a virus. Um, or the big thing is religion, believe it or not. Um, you're, you're talking about the five major religious houses of this world. Um, Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. And you're asking them, oh, yeah, you know, don't do anything stupid like come back at science and want revenge. That's a tall order because, you know, religion has been taken a pounding for five centuries. So that's, that's really what they have to lose. And that's, where, that's kind of where we are right now. So the whole motive of this, of keeping this giant secret is not financial. It's, it's just. No, no it's, it's more the, power. It's more power people, than financial. Just keeping the people it, mean, working. It, yeah. Can you put a price on your own civilization? I mean, yeah, you might be able to profit from it, but this thing is bigger than money. Meaning, uh, you know, it, let's put it this way. 
the Antarctic Treaty, a perfect example of that. So Antarctica, the early expedition said the place is just made out of money. Right? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a mountain range made out of coal, there's uranium, there's minerals, there's oil and gas. Billions upon billions and billions of dollars. You know, everyone was ready to carve this thing up. And then all of a sudden they said, you know what? Not worth it. Not worth the hassle. Because if you, let's say you take British Petroleum and you put them down there. Doesn't take long before it ha you know, a helicopter, plane goes off course. And, you know, you don't want to take that chance that all of a sudden they see something they shouldn't have seen, mm -hmm. whatever it is, because then it's a loose end. You know, then what do you do? Do you bribe them? Do you get rid of them? Right. You know, how do you explain this? And then, you know, it's a slippery slope because that's just one oil company to where there's good. Somebody came along and said, you know what? The money's not worth it. It's not freaking worth it. Shut it all down. And so they locked down Antarctica for all time. You can go down there if you're a scientist mm -hmm. or if you're a military scientist. Um, but no corporation is allowed to set shop, shop up there ever. For, I've, had a, I don't, I've had a friend that's been to Antarctica and he was posting. So the, I, I've got a friend who has been to Antarctica, uh, the South Oh, Pole. yeah. No, you can go. Mm. You can go to Antarctica. No PK, question. You can spend. PK, but yep. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, you can go. You can you can have your picture taken with penguins. You can spend the ten thousand pounds or whatever it is. I know to, it's not cheap, to... I don't think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but as a corporation, what blew me away was it went everything that we were as um, a civilization. We're look, everyone knows, especially in cap the capitalism world, which is most of it, um, that everything runs off of greed and power and money. So not only let's say you had a country that fired up tomorrow and you became an economic power. The second you become an economic power, a piece of paper is put in front of you and says, yeah, by the way, you can't go to Antarctica. And you're like, what? Until how, for how long? Forever. Nobody does. And it's like, why? It's national security, whatever, whatever reason they want to throw at you. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that treaty isn't even up for debate until 2041. It's the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. Nobody owns Antarctica. Now they'll they'll you can, they can come by and say oh yeah you know there's sliver of this and sliver of that but come on if you're the head of here's here's the part that just that really kind of pushed me it was my my little tipping point but now you know before I went all in which was not only is British Petroleum not allowed to set up shop there they're not even allowed to talk about it you'd think that you know lobbying you know we have lobbyists in the United States that just spend gobs of money just throw them at politicians you know we can corrupt a politician in two seconds and yet. The British, British Petroleum doesn't run a full page ad in the London Times for the last 30, 40 years saying how great it would be for us to go down to Antarctica. Nope. At some level, somebody is told by whoever, Minister of Defense or whatever, it's like, yeah, if you ever think about doing this, don't. And that's all there is to it. You know, just don't. And it's a matter of national security. And, and that's it. That's just a blanket coverage. Nobody even questions it anymore. You don't think that could be explained away with, um, you know, things like preservation or. Um... I, I, I would have I would have thought that, too. And I put that in my original clues, which was, yeah, you know, like under the guise of environmentalism. Sure. Why not? Except the Greenpeace, Greenpeace, one of the early people, you know, that wasn't even founded until the 70s. And it was really, really small. This was back in 1959. So environmentalism, I can tell you right now from where we were, we, it wasn't even a word. <laughs> hmm. You know, we we burned things down. We could care less. It's like gas was 30 cents a gallon. <laughs> it's like right. we just went through it. So but no, I, I'm sorry that it's it just we let me give you another, another quick example in the United States. I don't know what they do. I, I, I think they do a little bit down in your neck of the woods. But the whole fracking thing, you've mm -hmm. heard of it, yep. obviously. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We can frack in somebody's backyard tomorrow. If we want to up here, we can just pay. We just pay off people. We just give them briefcases full of money and we can, we can start fracking. Right. And that is destroying everything. You know, the West is just a, just pockmarked with that stuff. And yet those same companies can't even talk about going down there. Yeah. Remember that's fracking in, in somebody's personal backyard, right. Antarctica. There's no <laughs> plant life. There's no animal life. I'm not counting the penguins, no animal life. There's no indigenous populations. There's just nothing. It's just this weird 14,000 foot high plateau of snow and ice. I anyway. mean, that could be because no one owns it, though. I mean, you can't just go to, um, well, yeah, it's but not a landmass, is, is it? It's just ice. So, uh, okay, let me give you one more. Um, well, no, it is landmass. I it's, thought the it's, North I mean, yeah. Pole was landmass and the South Pole was not. No, I'm it's the, it's the wrong, sorry. Yeah, it's, no, it's the opposite. Okay, it's, no, it's okay. A lot of people confuse it. Yep. In fact, the bigger question is, like, why isn't there a landmass in the North Pole? But we won't get into that. 
Um, but in the South Pole, um, like uh, Admiral Byrne, he went on national television. I included it in one of my clips. You can find it. It's really easy to find. And he was worried that people were actually, your point of like nobody owns it. He was worried that people were going to start fighting over it because of all the resource. There was at least nine countries down there when he was down there in the, in the late 50s. Russia, needed, I'm sorry, Soviet Union needed the resources. UK needed the resources, especially after World War II. Everybody, you know, we love resources. And yet nobody, it's like literally the treaty was put in place. Nobody even argued it. They're like, yep. Everyone, it, it was like at one year, it was like, oh, this place is great. We're going to slice this baby up. And then two years later, it's like, yeah, everyone's got to get out of here. Nobody ever, ever come back. And we're going to put a padlock on it. Okay. <laughs> nobody ever comes down here. It's like, okay, sure. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Along with it. I'll have to. Um, anyway. yeah, uh, no. Well, what about um, melting ice caps? Is that all bullshit? You know, no, cl climate change? No, it's, yeah, it's so weird. I, I have never gotten so many questions in the last two years. First two years I was doing this, nobody ever asked me about climate change. Now everybody's asking me, do I think it's real? Yeah, I do. I, I absolutely think it's real. But I think it's real for a completely different reason in that if it's an enclosed system, if it's a building, then it makes way more sense because, you know, especially just like the term greenhouse gases, doesn't that term make more sense if it's an actual greenhouse? Because then the gases don't go anywhere. They just kind of sit in here and, and, you know, make it heavier and heavier and heavier and no different than, um, and everything would get wild. It'd be like no different than putting a propane lantern in your car when the air conditioning is running. Well, one propane lantern, your car air conditioning is going to one work harder and there's going to be weird little hot and cold spots in your car based on this lantern. Now put another one in, another one, in, another one in. Now, granted, that's an exaggeration, but the point is, is everything makes much more sense. So, are is is the ice system melting? Yeah, probably. Is it getting warmer? You know, probably. Even though they got rid of the global warming term as fast as they possibly could because it's a scary term and nobody, you know, that's straight out of science fiction movies. Nobody likes hearing that term. Um, now. If we are in a building, then the system is going to adjust. The automated system is going to adjust. The water system is going to adjust. The, the jet stream is going to adjust. It's going to try, but I don't think it can compensate completely for it, uh, which is why we have the weirdest weather all the time now. And it, yeah, it is, of course, it's getting warmer. Right. Um, and, and people can fight over that all they want. Unfortunately, it's a bigger issue, which is, again, because civilization's already been built, can you shut everything down to the point where you can reduce the damage or reverse, you know, what has been done without taking civilization back a hundred years? I don't know. Maybe. Well, if So if the ice caps are melting, is this, um, so that would be a threat to Antarctica, which everyone's protecting. Correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would why, be a threat, sure. why would the powers that be, be apart from, you know, just keeping business as usual, uh, why would all the right wing, which the world is kind of majority right wing at the moment, why would they be denying it, saying it's rubbish, it's fine, business as usual, let's melt these ice caps? If they're the why, people okay, in why, charge... Why why, okay, kind, kind, the reason why they would deny it, if I heard your question right, is why why make it business as usual why keep going down this destructive path right because kind of like the the same reason why we didn't even figure out what this place was until almost 1960 and then i mean look how long it took for us before we started even re looking at the floral carbon issue and the carbon dioxide issue and and all of a sudden say hey you know we might be actually causing some damage i mean for god's sakes we, we told people in this country that cigarettes were great for like 20 something years. Right. <laughs> and then it's yep. like, oh, hey, yes, they aren't great. <laughs> um, so when it came to Antarctica, I think, I think they realized eventually there was an end game, which was eventually sooner or later, you're going to have to release to the public what's going on and, and, or not or collapse the whole thing. Uh, but I think it was more, like a, more a stall than anything else. Why, why shut down industry? I mean, come on. The, if, if you ask anybody you know, what the greatest invention was in the history of mankind, what made the most impact, most of the people, I would hope anyway, would choose the internal combustion engine. Well, there, there's your problem right there. I mean, internal combustion engine, which launched our, our civilization to new heights, also would be our downfall because the byproduct of it is, well, nothing good. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, basically it's great. Basically it's the, they're peddling that narrative of climate change is rubbish because they just want to keep making money for the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, big business, 
there's a there's a something I hate using, but it's true, and that is the lawyers' rules still apply, which is it's a lawyers' rule world now, and that is you deny, you deny, you deny, you deny until they absolutely have you, and only then maybe then you you fess up again. The cigarettes a perfect example. You know, they fought it. They knew full well. You know, they fought it. They fought it. They fought it. They with threw gobs of money at it. And only at the end, when they knew they were going to lose, did they lose. You know, and they, they you know, or, or how, here's one of my other favorites. Uh, we'll take it to a, a micro level. Lance Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Brilliant example. Lance Armstrong won title after title. And year after year, every press conference, they were just grilling him, you know, saying, are you cheating? Are you cheating? Are you cheating? Frank? No, no, no. And then after seven years, finally, when, you know, one of his drug guys ratted him out and they mm. absolutely had him, only then did he come back and say, yeah, yeah, I was, I was lying the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, totally. So, um, like but, we, I mean, you know, he's got his whole livelihood to protect there. But I think what I'm getting stuck on at this, if there's a global conspiracy that is protected by the powers above, so above yeah. government, you know, um, Illuminati, Bilderbergs, whatever you want to call them, um, I would have thought that it would be in their best interest to shut these right wingers up who want business as usual. I would have thought that if they've protected this um, enormous conspiracy theory, made up all these laws of physics to support it, everything, uh, I would have thought they'd probably have their hands on uh, the politicians a little firmer than business as usual. Let's melt it all down. And, you know, it seems a little, it, little lazy from the, from the Illuminati's. Uh, <laughs> they need to work it's hard. Not <laughs> no, no, no. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. It's not a bad idea. Uh, no, I, 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 I know where you're going with this. And uh, I think, uh, honestly, I don't think it was a um, kind of like the, the flat earth, how, you know, dome or dome or, or no dome. I think there was probably disagreement within, let's just call them the Illuminati, hmm. within some of those meetings. Right. I think that there, I think there were disagreements on, on how exactly things were going to move forward or not to move forward. You know, I was like, what do you do? You know, do you do you cut back civilization and not take technology to a certain level? You know, they'll say, well, you know, some people, the argument is, do you, do you keep progress going, even though you know full well that the progress will ultimately mean your doom? Or do you subvert and stagnate product progress to where you're just kind of simmering and you're not really achieving it? You know, men, men with power always want more power. And right. the empire, they want the empire to be bigger and they want things to branch out and to create, I think... If it was just me, let's say I was part of this. If I wanted to create a new world order, the only way you could really do that is to 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 make take civilization as far as you could, let some sort of event burn down the parts you didn't like, mm -hmm. and then what was or was left, well, maybe you could create some shiny, gleaming future. Would that, that be what uh, maybe COVID nineteen is, or? Yeah, I want to ask you about well, you know, your, no, your let's let's bring, <laughs> let's bring it up. No, no, I have been I have been really big on saying this last three weeks um, in different podcasts, which is look, I have never seen I okay first first and foremost, I think that that COVID nineteen is just a precursor for another event because everything that's been done with the virus, I'm just going to call it the virus, mm -hmm. is to is to facilitate one thing and one thing only, and that is to keep people home. Everybody home. The kids go home. The college kids go home. Sorry, university kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, you don't go to work. You're not going to the bars or the gym or church. There's nothing open. I mean, literally, as of right now. In fact, the the podcast I'm going to do on Tuesday, I'm literally going to call it um, "Half of the World Is on House Arrest" right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, and it's true. I mean, you've got three and a half billion people at least, especially since India kicked in. There yeah. were 1.3 just on their own. I worry um, for India. I really worry for <laughs> India. <laughs> I mean, but but the thing is, it doesn't act like anything. It's the one thing the movies get right. It doesn't act like it acts just like a flu, a variation of the flu. And the it, I'm not trying to be callous here and saying that you can put a price on human life. You absolutely can, unless it's your family members, and then you can't. Right. We we done it war in business. I can give you all sorts of examples. Yeah, all yeah. Long. No, I, I you know but, I agree. But <laughs> the hype, the hype behind this. Look, in the United States, we we what hit fifteen hundred people out of a nation of three hundred and thirty million, and America is closed. We've and and I've been trying to give perspective to people. I've gone look nine eleven. Don't care what you think about it. Three thousand people died. Everything was still open. 
Mm. Right. Yeah. Fine. We, we closed down flights for a few days for obvious reasons, but the rest of America was open. We all went out to the bars and like, yeah, it sucks to be in New York. Threw them back. That's what we did. Um, 50, I don't care if it's 10,000, unless it hits mid five digits. Mm. Uh, it's, it means nothing, nothing, because it is a smoke screen for something else. I believe, I firmly believe, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I believe there's an event that this is being set up for. Something to where everyone is supposed to be home because, and I'll, I'll give you the, the example of why. Because people panic less when the general public is home, when the family unit is at home. I'll give you a quick, quick example, which is um, there was an earthquake, let's say 10 years ago, in Washington, D.C., of all places. Big, pretty big earthquake, uh, enough to where like the Washington Monument was cracked, <laughs> type mm. type deal. Didn't fall over, but it was cracked. What was interesting? What was that? What happened that morning? What happened that morning was instantly, as soon as the earthquake happened, every mother called the schools. Every mother called every school. It was like, "Where are my kids? Where's my kids?" And and because of that, all the phone lines jammed up instantly. And then when anything happened, as soon as the phone line jammed up, it's like, I can't get there. They put the phone down. They got into their car, and everyone j- jumped onto the freeway at high speeds, and all the freeways jammed up. Instantly. That, that, that all happened in about 30 minutes. Imagine that happening on a national scale. You know, you don't want that happening. So whatever is happening now, whatever is going to follow this, what, whatever it is, the event, I just called the event. Um, this is the reason why the virus is being overhyped deliberately. If you want to call them by the powers that be, that's fine. Deliberately. And people are buying it. They're absolutely. I mean, look at look at the UK. I mean, how many countries? I can't even list off all the countries that are on lockdown. Hmm. Right yeah. now, uh, basically all of NATO, India, Russia, uh, China. We have no idea what the hell's going on in China. Yeah. The only ones that, that aren't are like all of Africa and most of South America. How do you lock down them anyway? Yeah. So, so it is go. a real virus. So, it is a. Real do I think virus? it's a real virus? Yeah. 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 Sure. I mean, why? Why not? I mean, a lot of people also don't know that this is COVID. Was it COVID nineteen? There's a whole bunch of coronaviruses out there yeah. that have been there for, you know, some have mild effects, some have stronger respiratory effects. Um, you can look at the back of um, a can of Lysol, for example, you know, the disinfectant spray, and it'll tell you right on the label. It's like, oh, yeah, really good at stopping coronavirus. Yeah. I've seen Way a few before this. Like that. That. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not, it's it's been around. Do I think it's real? Sure. Are the numbers sure, real? I do, but the what? The numbers? The death toll, the the infections, do you reckon they, that's I, I, faked? I, tough to tell because so I'm not right trying to now, Alex Jones you. I'm not trying to No 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 it's it's okay. No, <laughs> I have curious. I have mixed feelings on it because for the first hundred deaths in the United States, we weren't showing anybody. Hmm. We we were saying, Oh, in fact, we weren't even giving names, we weren't even giving genders. We were saying a man in Phoenix, you know, in his 70s, or no, not even. We were saying Per patient in his se- in their seventies died in Phoenix, hmm. and so could they be? Could the death tolls be inflated? Sure, why not? Uh, especially if you're doing it with elderly. You know, you, you grab some people that are um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That already have underlying conditions, and they were already in precarious position anyway. And if they die, how hard would it be? It's like, oh yeah, you know, chalk them up to to the virus. Uh, maybe, but even if they're real. <clears throat> Even if they're real, I'm sorry, I did a, a thing two weeks ago where I was just lashing out. I'm going, look, there are, that doesn't even, the numbers for this virus aren't even cracking the bottom 20 ways to die in the United States. Not even the bottom 20. Hmm. You, like, for example, right now you have a um, one in 250,000 chance of dying in the United right. States from, from the virus. 250,000. You have a one in 25,000 chance of being killed, just being shot. By somebody that's actually higher than i thought it would be hmm. like one in twenty five thousand. that's 10 times you have 10 times more chance right now of getting shot and killed by somebody um or like one in fifty thousand just walking down the street and getting and hit by know, a car getting, or whatever yeah getting hit yep. by a car and um and just what i you know i elicit all these things and i'm going why is every and nobody's even resisting you know they it was like this giant peer pressure wave that, that's that that swelled over the country it's like you know once the nba closed then baseball closed and then and then uh, football season and then every you know the, the golf and nascar and it's like really you close golf it's freaking outside and they're not even near each other or you know but no so like there's this weird paradox you can like you can golf the golf courses are open but you can't do tournaments right 
uh, you can you can you can drive your car around a track, but you can't have a crowd there. And it just it just goes on and on. So anyway, yeah. Do I think there's something else tied to this? Could it be tied to us? Yeah, maybe. What's the uh, the big event that you um, the big event believe could be? Could why, be why the hell not? It um, was something that I that I predicted two years ago, which is I said that uh, I go the only I go sooner or later because our numbers just kept getting bigger and bigger. I go sooner or later they're going to have to get on top of this. So what do you do? Do you fess up? Or do you spin it in a way that you wanna you wanna spin it? You come out and and I say I in fact I joked. Now I'm regretting it. I said whatever's gonna happen. This was years ago. It's got to be bigger than flat Earth. You've got to actually just eclipse flat Earth entirely. I go probably just blow up a city or something, you right. know, something something big. And it's like this virus. Like right now on CNN, ninety percent of the uh, stories literally. 90% of the stories you just go down the list are tied to the virus in some way. Yeah. Nobody even nobody even wants to talk about anything else. And when you go to like Netflix, I don't know what it's like in in your neck of the woods. Yeah, we're but seeing like a Netflix, lot of preppers shows, things like that. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. trending on Netflix. Yeah. It's all freaking outbreak, pandemic, contagion, doomsday preppers, 2012. I mean 2012, my god, that movie's 11 years old. Mm. Oh hell. Um outbreak is 25 years old yeah and that's now in the top 10 come on yeah. <laughs> anyway so um, yeah it's weird super weird i mean one thing i worry about is what no one really thinks about what if something happens on top of this like so we've got this crazy outbreak everyone's locked at home what if there is the big earthquake in la or or yeah that was one of that was one of my enormous, top five yeah enormous terrorist attack i mean um, and that's not even I'm not even coming from a conspiratorial point of view. I'm just thinking. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like I mean, that's that's web. good writing, by the way. Mm. I mean, if you want, that's that's how the great stories go. Where it's like, okay, there's this crisis that's happening. You're going, oh, you know, it, it, and you're thinking, okay, will will we be able to resolve it? And as that's getting louder and louder, boom, you get blindsided with something that's absolutely out. It's like, oh no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we're in trouble. It does. It does worry. It plays on my mind that, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, maybe it's a kindness. And I said this a, a couple of weeks ago, I, you know, bringing people home. And I have seen this, you know, where I am up in Seattle, there are families now that are together for the first time. Mm. You know, there are families with smaller children that are, that are walking around and, and you can tell it's like, you know, there's, there's kind of a warmth there where people are. And that's, that's what, you know, if you wanted to make, you want to have a mercy, let's say there was some big event, you know, let's say, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. You remember the movie 2012? Yes. From, from back in the day. That would be a perfect example because the, one of those taglines, which was finally a realistic one, which was, you know, what, how would the government tell you, you know, that the end was coming? And the tagline is they wouldn't. Yeah. They, they, they wouldn't tell you. In fact, if anything, they would do what's happening here, which is, okay, we'll just put the families together. That way, again, if I was doing it, that way, no matter what happens, let's say it's a big earthquake. Let's say a San Andreas just dumps the whole West Coast, you know, just the whole thing and, you know, power outages and it gets really, really bad. The infrastructure, if you want to rebuild an infrastructure after that, it's way, way easier if the family is in one place. Because if it isn't, oh my God, especially, no offense to mothers, but they just go off the freaking rails. <laughs> There's like, wait, where's my kid? He's 35 miles away. I'm not doing anything until, you know, they're going to run over people to, to yep. you know, multiply that by, by all the mothers. So it, to have the, especially the, the, anyone high school age or younger, having them home, really a great idea. You know, if you're going to build up for something after, mm. just my theory anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, back to flat earth. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the actual um, who made it. I would be very interested to see what your perspective is on this. Okay, Ooh, yeah, so who made it? The actual. Okay. Maybe we'll just start with the actual physics of what we are standing on. So, is it a construction? Do you think it's a con it's a constructed? Oh, it like is it a physical construction or is it virtual? Is that what you're asking? No, I was asking, is it a physical structure? We'll go down virtual, but yeah. So it's a physical thing. Basically, what I'm um, angling at is geology. There's no metal rods that we know of that we've seen or detected. Uh, we have rock systems deep, deep, deep down the earth. We have earthquakes. We have uh, a very complex geological system that is below us. That no, that's that's good. Okay, so first off, who made it? Um, let, let's go into that real quick. 
Uh, you can only go down one of two roads, either an advanced civilization that's much older and much more powerful than ourselves <laughs> or some sort of deity. But at that point, you're really just kind of splitting hairs because, come on, if a giant golden spaceship all of a sudden landed somewhere in Paris, you'd have two groups of people. One group would say, oh, wow, giant blue people. They do look like Avatar. Or the other group, which would be, we must form a church to the giant blue people. <laughs> and right. then a new church would, would, would found. I mean, their people would be worship them as gods and their other people would be like, oh, wow, it's not anything like I look. I thought they'd be like Predator or something. <laughs> um, but when it comes to the actual structure of the whole place, the design, very, very clever. And when it comes to, the, let, let's look at the geologic side, which I, which I love so much, which is because some people say, well, how, how thick, like how deep, is flat earth yes right? how, how, how deep would it be and i go i don't know how deep is earth you know your your globe earth and and of course people go into well you know if you dig straight down it's four thousand miles till you get to the center and i go really i mean how do you how do you know that and they go well because you know we, we've seen you know we, we've got these cutaway diagrams and blah 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 you know with the, the the red and orange and yellow and white bands and all that stuff and then I, I, again, it was one of those things that I discovered, little scientific factoids as I'm digging into this, no play on words there, which was that the deepest hole ever drilled wasn't even half that. It wasn't a thousand miles. It wasn't even a hundred miles. It wasn't even 10 miles. Is that the one in it Russia? Eight, uh, Russia and or Germany. They both okay. tried for it. Hmm. Um, 12, 12 kilometers for you. I'll do kilometers. Um, and they tried for years to get past 12 kilometers. Could not do it. And Why? they would um no, no. Um for whatever reason the the bits, if you want to say it was just magma at eight miles, which doesn't go along with their other models, they did the, the bits kept melting. Right. They they couldn't they couldn't get them past eight miles. And they tried. I mean they they tried for a very, very long time. But eight miles should not be the the, the capper there. Um so when I tell when I tell people, you know, I say, okay, you know, if the deepest hole is drilled is eight miles. I don't know. I mean, this place could be 50 miles thick. Do I think there's some subterranean things? Sure. But I also think there's things built in to stop us from going, you know, any further than that. So, and of course, I always had the thought was, you know, if you were military, and this, that's civilian, you know, drilling with, you know, bits that are going down eight miles. If you were military, well, if you want to have some fun with it, I mean, technically you could nuke your way down hmm. to eight miles and you should be able to nuke your way past it because, you know, you could vaporize basically a mile at a chunk. Yep. You know, the, the underground testing, you can just blow holes. I mean, that's how they build underground stuff nowadays. They just nuke the whole thing and, and you know, build it in the cavern. But I think there's it's part of the system. I don't think you can go down indefinitely for obvious reasons. They don't want you to go down very far. There's negative reinforcements built into this place that, uh, that are very clever that kind of make you dissuade. That it, just, it turns you away that makes it look like it's you're the one that's doing it. Um, Antarctica would be a perfect example of that, which was, you know, Antarctica, you know, in, in our world, you know, we'll call it, you want to call it the ice wall, you can, but as you're nearing Antarctica, icebergs usually will scare away a whole bunch of people. You get there, you know, you get on top of the ice shelf, a couple hundred feet. And then as you're going through it, you know, it ramps up to 14,000 feet. Most people don't know that most of Antarctica, even mainstream science, is at 14,000 feet high, which is twice that of altitude sickness and for most people. And then there's nothing to eat. There's no plant. There's nothing to shoot. I mean, when you get in there, it's just it's just barren. It just screams, go away. So eventually, you're like, yeah, I'll just turn back. And that's the the same way with everything. Um, you know, the altitude stuff that we deal with. You know, why can't people? You know, why can't a balloon go up forever? You know, and you can breathe. You know, while the air gets thinner and thinner and thinner until finally you just turn you turn away until you have a rocket program, and then that's a whole other thing. Right. So. Why would their, um, when they're digging the holes, why would their equipment melt if the earth is hollow? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't That's think, I don't think it's hollow. I, I don't think it's hollow. Nah. All right. So uh, do I think there's the magma system in place? Sure. Yeah. Why, why not? Volcanoes are real. We, we all know that. Um, now, what's below the magma system? Do I think there could be a, a hollow system under that? Sure. Sure. Why? Why not? I mean, again, the easiest place to hide people is subterranean. So, could you? Could there be some cooler spots? Yeah. I mean, like the deepest oceans, Marianas Trench. Could you? Could you put a a cat? Because remember, you can do a cavern, very very small. You could put a very comfortable civilization under there. 
Yeah. I think that's where most of the previous civilizations go. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one thing I should throw in there, which is I don't think we're the first people to rent this apartment. Not by a long shot. And and a lot, loads of conspiracy guys will go along with that. I mean, yep. Sunken City is off in Japan. I used to be Sunken City's- right down the rabbit hole of ancient civilizations. That was my, oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Was I my mean, conspiracy theory that I that I bit into really hard. But, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, a, they- I'm a big fan. I, I was a big fan of ancient aliens before I got into this. I mean, even though I thought it was a bit sensationalized, I got to tell you, some of the old ruins. Whew, pretty amazing. You know, yeah, it, it, pretty it, hard to explain. So, yeah, pretty hard to explain. I mean, I, I even, it inspired, ancient aliens inspired me to go to the real pyramids, you know, and I encourage anybody, it's like, look, if you have the means, freaking go and stand in front of them. Don't listen to the tour guides and just stare at the damn thing or things and say, yeah, these, they built these when, because, you know, you're sitting next to Cairo. That's the thing that throws you. It's not just the pyramids. I mean, yeah. the pyramids is one thing, but you're, when, when you're looking at, you drive through Cairo and you look at the people there and you're going, yeah, these are the descendants of this. No, right. <laughs> Not a right, chance. Right, right. I don't know who built these things, but it wasn't these guys. Yeah. I, I volunteered in 2013 uh, to help excavate the Bosnian pyramid. I'm not sure if you've heard of. Oh, I'm very familiar <laughs> with that. That's <laughs> awesome. You Really? You were yeah, out there? Yeah. So I went there for two and? weeks. Um, to be honest, I mean, this was the main reason I went was because I, at that time I was hook, line and sinker conspiracy guy to the point where I was just becoming a pretty annoying argumentative person because I just couldn't understand why the people couldn't see what I see. Um, yeah. So I decided, well, this one seems really, really interesting. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and I'm going to go see for myself. Um, it was a great time. It was a wonderful, it was basically camp conspiracy. Um borderlining a kind of culty vibe um, where <laughs> people were kind of coming from all over the world with different um, opinions of the giants made it. Uh, no, the ant people made it. That's why the tunnels are here. And just all these different kind of mythological things that they're taking is um, there's a giant UFO deep, deep under. It's it's shooting out a, a laser beam at the top. And um, I think after a while, my, my mind frame was where all the, where the good guys right? Us yeah. conspiracy people, we're the ones that seen through the veil. We're the good guys, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call it. They're the bad guys. But the infighting, I found such a massive turnoff. And it also uh, struck me how every single person thought, just knew that they were right. The people with the laser beam shooting out, they, they knew they were right. And everyone else is stupid for not agreeing with them. The ant people, um, you know, of course, that's it. If you look at all this stuff and anecdotal evidence and and then the conspiracy started within this really small group that the, the guy who's actually showing us around, he's actually not an architect. He's actually an agent that's put in himself. And then all of a sudden there's this distrust. And I said, you know what? This is the mind frame uh, that a lot of conspiracy theory thinking can send you down. And, and I think the underlining thing that I saw was this paranoid distrust uh, that that's really inbuilt with a lot of these uh, thinkers, which I think it's right. wonderful to question everything. I always, I still do, even though I'm not a huge conspiracy guy these days. But that to me just goes, uh, okay, these are the people writing the blogs. You know, all those amazing YouTube videos that are so gripping. I'm like, these are the people. And you think that they know something wise and deep, but they were just really good at putting shit together on YouTube. And that yeah. kind of, for me, put put me off and... In terms of the actual evidence that the Bosnian pyramid um, provided, I'm not a geologist. They they show pictures of these block-like shapes, but they were all really inconsistent. So if you were having one builder, you know, some are, you know, I don't know, a few meters wide, some are almost 50 meters wide. Um, and then I don't know. Whenever I asked questions, they were explained in very airy fairy ways. Uh. A lot of you know, a lot of energy stuff, and well, this and. Uh, a lot of bovis meters that they said. And then I asked, asked, what is bovis? And it's like, well, it's energy that they, they can measure. It's spiritual energy. And they and then I said, well, how do you find that? And they demonstrated with a crystal and a piece of string. And, oh, no. And I'm like, wow, okay, these are the foundations. Okay, okay. So it kind of, for me, set me a little straight. And to be honest, there's a lot of weird stuff about that Bosnian pyramid, but I'm not 100% convinced it's created. 
So ah, got it. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 spiritual energy thing when anyone tries to tie that to anything, you know, no offense to the people who are in tune, mm. but it's like come on. Yeah. Come on, you can't you can't use that all the time for everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's kind of like a lot of the time I was going to ask, which way do you lean the aliens or the God side? Because um, I, I just think God is a bit of a cop out answer for why this was um, created personally. People, you know, it's funny. Not a lot of people ask me, you know, which way do I go? The aliens or the God side? Because I don't necessarily believe in aliens anymore. Really? I be well because not not in the traditional. Okay, these guys are from Jupiter, obviously, and these guys have three eyes, so they've got to be from Venus, and you know all the all the Twilight Zone stuff. Mm. Um, because for me, you know, the planets are just lights in the sky. Now, do I believe in interdimensional travel? Sure. Why the hell not? I mean, people, the average person doesn't even understand that you have music flying around you in different radio stations that you can't hear and television yeah. stations that you can't see. I love that analogy, you know, try describing uh, infrared to a, you know, a caveman. They'd be like, what the yeah. fuck are you talking oh, about? Oh yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah, there. yeah, ab 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 absolutely. And tech, I mean, we've, we, how 20 years ago, trying to explain to kids, you know, it's mm. like 20 years ago, we didn't even have HD. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had crappy television. We didn't even know it, mm. you know, yeah. in, until it came out. So, um, but do I think there's two things? Okay, do I think there's things flying around there in in you know in ships? Yeah, I do. I can see them all day long with infrared um, uh, or night vision binoculars. This is amazing stuff, amazing stuff flying around at all times. I thought it's like you can see it all day long. I used to sky watch when I was out in Colorado for a number of years before I got into flat Earth, and it's like wow. You saw some cool shit. The what? Did you see some cool shit? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, initially, what? Because there was a, it was a British guy of all things. He he said, he was he was he was talking about stuff, and he was silhouetted. And at the very end of his interview, he goes, he goes, you want to see some weird stuff? He goes, get a freaking night vision thing and start looking up at the sky and something. You see, I'm going, that sounds like a wager. <laughs> so I went and I I went through different night vision stuff, and I got these um, night owl night vision things. I'm looking up there, and the first night I'm going. Oh, this is so boring. Yeah, you can see like there's a way more satellites. There's just so many things flying around, but they're obviously satellites because that's what we're told. And then I go back the next night and I'm watching the satellites and I'm going, it's so boring. And then all of a sudden the satellite just stops. It just slows down to like it's lost. And then it's like, and then, then it makes like a hard right turn and goes ballistic at a, at a rate of speed I've never seen before, all without any sound. And I'm going, huh? what was that? Yeah, right. And then... Uh oh, I think I've lost you. Damn it. I always at the good bits. And, then, and am I still there? Uh -oh. Yep, got you back. Got you back. Testing, testing. Okay, oh. okay. <laughs> Damn, so, right at the um, punchline. <laughs> well, no, no, that's because that's they're listening. Yeah, the, that's um, true. <laughs> the, uh, uh, no, they, they, it took off at, at a rate of speed. And I was like, what was, what the hell was I looking ju at just then? And what's interesting is they fly at a level, they fly about twice, at least twice the height of commercial airliners. I was in this perfect place where I was next to an international airport. So I saw inbound and outbound, very easy to tell the difference. And you could see those things clear as day with, um, with in night vision. And these things always fly. And I think Steven Spielberg was making kind of a joke about it because they fly about the same distance to where about the same sh size as stars in a lot of the cases and i remember this one thing from close encounters of the third kind and everyone laughed and i get it now where the spaceships as they were flying around the mountain they all the some of them got in the form of a big dipper and the big dipper kind of slid across the sky and richard Dreyfus laughs and and people laugh things like oh look it's a big dipper no they could absolutely do it if they if they just throw it in neutral whatever's up there no one you could not tell them from stars you would not be able to tell them because you can't you can't zoom in far enough to see them hmm. but my god there's a lot of stuff flying around up there and they do this i mean it's i almost can't think they were it's not like they were military they was like they were commuters it's right. like they had their own freeway system and people were just going home and driving back and i there was um there was a group that would fly at night that i called driver's education i don't know if you have them driver's education where you are no not that I know of. Oh, lost you. Sorry. One moment. Lost your audio. Uh-oh. There really? you go. Got you back. Got you back. They're listening, okay. Mark. They're listening. Okay. Yeah, they are. <laughs> so at, at um, 
there would be a squadron of anywhere from three to 15 and they would all be like tethered together to where they were just 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 whipping around the sky and people going oh it's no it's birds i'm going those are not freaking birds i go they make no sound and they go from horizon to horizon in like 30 seconds uh it was just brilliant and um they reminded me of the first um the the first time a, a flying saucer was coined which was only about 100 miles from here where uh, a, a Cessna pilot was flying above a tree tree range and there were uh, a bunch of UFOs in like a V pattern below him going across the tree line. And he said they looked like upside down teacup saucers. And mm. he goes, but they seemed like they were connected by something, something invisible. You know, and I call I call him driver's ed. I think it's great. Right. Anyway, so, yeah, I saw. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, off, off base for a second there, which is. So do I think there's there's aliens no i just think there's older versions of us right Meaning, that, that's what i was going to ask all this all yeah. the stories but you don't believe in aliens so they you just think they're more advanced I humans just, further down the line yeah yeah i think they're i think that everybody has their time here like, who knows maybe we're we're at our moment now where um uh where you have a certain amount of time before and once you figure it out i think that also has something to do with it if you're at a technology which is just about to figure out where you are I think you are moved off, kind of like a graduating class. Hmm. You you don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here, type of thing. And then because we have to move another class in, and how that transition goes is is anybody's guess. Now those whoever's flying around up there though, they didn't. I don't think they built this place. I think they're just either they they, they lived here. They could be superintendents. They could be maintenance people, or who knows? Maybe they're just um, previous civilizations. But what I like to tell people is. Is that whoever they are, there's rules they have to follow, and what I mean by that is they're not allowed for whatever obvious reasons. Look, look at Star Trek Prime Directive, which is you can't just land in somebody's main square, town square, come out, take a couple of selfies, and sign autographs, and you know, hey, go everybody, and then take off. I mean, you would make way too much of an impact. Hmm. Um, and so they don't. I, I think there's some real rules to follow, um, which is I'll throw at you really quick. The um, I ask people is like, you know, what's the what do you think the, the most popular, most famous UFO sighting is of all time? And so people will say, well, it's Roswell or something like that. And it's like, no, it's not. It's 1561 Nuremberg. Right? It's, it's it's got its own wiki entry, hmm. as a matter of fact, which is um, you know, wonderful day in Nuremberg, Germany, crystal clear day two huge armadas in fact it was on ancient aliens um two ancient armadas just showed up and just started hammering on each other over the city and nuremberg was a big city back then for an hour to where you know an hour is a long time hammering on each other like, meaning fighting like, yeah fighting yeah, yeah yeah and yeah you can you can say and to where uh, you know to where the the artists you know they had newspapers back then and the artist came out and sketched the drew the whole thing in great detail and they had no reference to it, though. There was no science fiction back in the 1500s. They either thought it was some biblical thing. The interesting thing was after that, after that full hour, a single giant angular black craft, and they left this out of ancient aliens. I don't know why, but I think I know why. Where it just pulled in between the two of them, those two groups scattered, and this thing hovered for a while and then flew off. Do you know how many questions that whole thing raises? It's like, okay, who are these first two guys? Why were they fighting? Who was the third group that showed up? Why were they scared of them? Were they the cops? Were they the UN? Mm. Who the hell were these guys? And of course, my big question, which other people don't ask, is like, what sort of response time is an hour to that? I mean, <laughs> they could have they could have leveled the city in an hour. It was amazing. And so, yeah, you can look. There's you can um, yeah, they, they've I got a wood card. Yeah, I'll they, they ran. You, it's still in the museum, but you can see the the wiki picture. It's part of my slideshow, which is. Um, uh, the cut, the the woodcut uh, of the whole thing that happened that day, and they, to this day, you know, they it's it's just overlooked. I don't know why, hmm. but it's uh, again, why why would it take you guys an uh, what them an hour to get there? It just blew me away. I mean, seriously, you would have finished your breakfast, <laughs> you yeah, smoke. You're still watching. I was like, still at it. Yep, still at it. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah. So, um, which way do you lean for the creator of of this oh, flat Earth? The what? Which way do you lean for the creator of this flat earth? Okay. Do I think... uh, For me, it's a little more complex. Do I think that... Do I believe in God? Yeah, I do. 
do I think that the highest level of God built this place? Or no, but I think he, he subcontracted out the work. Meaning I, I, I'm a big believer that you can, uh, you can get that the God ugh, I'm getting into areas I don't usually get into, but I'll, I'll do it for you. Please do. Which is, <laughs> thank you. Is, is I don't think it's enough. If you, if you're God, you know, we always like to think in human terms, we're thinking of God and make Morgan Freeman, God and whatever. <laughs> um, but I don't think that the God would just be satisfied. It's not interesting enough to just create a civilization or a series of civilizations that uh, that are in very basic stages of evolution, whatever. But it, maybe that's not the right word uh, of of whatever their technological advancement. I also think that it's more interesting to create a lesser entity, maybe a splinter of God, to oversee this. You know, meaning so. It's not just interesting enough to see how this develops on its own, but what if we created an un, a god with a or a deity with a random variable to it, which would kind of you know play into some things. You know the the Old Testament. It's like why did the why did the um, the Old Testament version of God seem to be a child with a temper tantrum most of the time? You know maybe maybe God is in in a, in a, or or whatever whatever you mean, deity like his, you want to call his and things like. This doesn't please me, so he created a flood. Yeah, 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 kind of yeah. Stuff. Yeah, why yeah. not? I mean, mm. think think of all the early myths and legends you heard about the world being simpler and easier. You know, that all the continents, for example, were all one big giant Pangea supercontinent, which also doesn't really make a lot of sense on a globe, but it doesn't in our flat model. And then things got spread out, or the fact that you know the early myths that the sky would get light and dark, but there was no sun and moon which is interesting because that's what we used to do in our early simulations. And people forget, I know you're not old enough, but the the early versions of our, even our video games didn't have a sun and the moon. The sky just got lighter or darker because you just made the sky lighter or darker. It was only later that it was like, well, let's put in a sun. That's kind of ornament, ornamental. People, the like the, the star, you know, they say, well, what are the stars and the moon and the planets? I go, it's just the biggest, oldest, most elaborate clock ever. That predates language. That's really all the the sky is is a giant ornamental clock system mm. that you yeah. don't even need a language for. And back in the days, if you watch it long enough, you'll pick up a few things. It's like, oh yeah, because in fact, I had a girl ask me um, just a couple of days ago. Um, uh, she asked me. She goes. She goes. Why not make it same sort of question? She goes. Why not make the sky black? Mm. Like, are you kidding? Human beings hate that. It's black. It's scary. You get no perspective at all. I go, I'd be just be depressing. <laughs> You'd learn nothing. It'd be like black. <laughs> I mean, plus the nighttime would be terrifying, you know. And I mean, because if you didn't have torches, what the hell would you do? Mm. So yeah. Anyway. Space. <clears throat> Is there space? Out of space. Does it exist? What's on the other side of this snow globe? Um, okay. Is there space as you know it? No, is is not what you what you think it is. Um, for the same reason, uh, I'll, I'll use the Carl Sagan quote. It's like he goes, if space is what we think it is, wow, it's awfully empty. <laughs> There's not a lot there. He goes, it seems like a lot of waste of resources. Um, the the illusion of space is what I like to tell people. It's kind of like a planetarium. If the illusion of space fools 99.999% of people, then you go with the illusion because it's way more efficient. So you create the illusion of space and then you can tell people whatever you want or better yet, have the people tell their own people whatever they want. They can just make up stuff i mean you know the the zodiac system you know the stories that revolved around all the all the zodiacs just amazing um however does that does it make it any less relevant because uh, two people have said oh are you killing astronomy i go no well, kind of um are you killing astrology no not at all because like the, the, there's an example which is look the stars everything you see is just lights in the sky it's much 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 closer it's not millions of light years away it's right there but does it take many mean anything less to people that are you know looking into your future you know with astrology? No, it makes it way more intimate. Um, in fact, in fact, it makes the the universe much more manageable. Uh, you don't have to come. I mean, think about it. If it, to, to create a solar system model, think of all the stuff you need to use. I mean, forget the globe can't even exist on itself. On itself, you need a solar system around that, gal a galaxy around that, a universe around that. You need um, geometry and trig and calculus and quantum mechanics and all sorts of fun stuff. You don't need any of that with, with ours. Now, to your question though, uh, which is, 
what's outside of this place. So if it's not space, so if space, you're just looking, you know, at a sky, you know, what's outside of here. Um, if you asked me three years ago, I would have said, I don't know, man. Uh, but what I, what I've kind of settled into is we, uh, cause I be, I'm a big believer in dualism, which is you cannot enjoy or even appreciate something without seeing its opposite, yeah. you know, light, light without shadow, hot without cold, play, ones yeah, and play. zeros. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Binary. <laughs> yep. And that's that I think is the same thing here. So for me, I always love the lowest common denominator, which is why my stuff, you know, I design it for anyone, hmm. uh, which is what's the lowest common denominator of this world. And no, I don't mean physically, you know, carbon or anything like that. Um, I mean, conflict. And that seems to be the the running thing. Doesn't matter how beautiful, how powerful, how talented, how rich you are, you are mired in conflict almost permanently. Meaning, the rich, all they care about is money, and everybody else that has money. If you're beautiful, you're looking in the mirror constantly. If you're talented, oh, my, one of my favorites is people don't know. All rock stars want to be athletes, and all athletes they want to be rock stars. Why? Why, why would you want this? Because the, the level of contentment built into us is almost impossible to achieve. I don't care. Even if you're a Zen master floating above a rock in the Himalayas, you're still going to have to deal with mortality sooner or later. You're going to have that last bowl of soup and you're dead. Mm -hmm. So if this world is 99% conflict, inescapable conflict, then whatever's outside of here has to be the opposite, meaning an unlimited universe, an unlimited uh, realm. And then then you get into the why, you know, and I'm not going to give you the exact why. It's like, why? Okay, why build this place? Why even build it? You know, if you're a, forget about the Illuminati, let's go a whole octave a few higher. steps up, that. yeah. Yeah, why, why build it if you're God? And uh, what I try to tell people is you build it because... Without this, you can't appreciate that other that other universe. And I, I throw it into something I wrote years ago, which was the um, the wish machine, which was we all know, you know, you rub the genie's lamp, genie pops up, he goes, I'll give you three wishes, and you're smart, and you go, ha ha, sucker, first wish, I get a million more wishes, and he's like, damn you, and and then you have to you go through your million wishes. No one can make it through a million wishes. Um, because eventually you run out of novelty, which is what I, one of the things I think the universe runs on. I think it's cyclical. So you just keep wishing for things, right? And we all, you know, we, we've all fantasized about it. You know, what, what would I wish for? And you wish about all the stuff. Well, eventually what happens when you, you know, again, no one's ever gotten to do it here. What happens when you reach that logical conclusion, which is you run out of wishes, you literally run out of ideas. You, your imagination is tapped out. What do you do? You go to the genie and you say, hey, um, I'm running out of ideas. You got anything? And I'd goes, wish yeah. for a better uh, imagination. Well, well yeah, <laughs> that's a nice idea, but it's still, it's still, it's good. Actually, it's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> but, but you still, it still has to come from somewhere. Yeah. You know, you've got to, it's got to be grounded in something. And even if you wish for a bad imagination, eventually it's got to, even that's going to be tapped out. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so he comes with, he says, okay, I got, I got something. You go to this place here, you spend 70 to 90 years. It's really horrible. You're going to complain about everything. It's going to suck. But, at the end, when you're done, when you come back, everything is going to be great. And and he says, yeah, but there's a catch. And it's like, really? What's the catch? So the catch is you won't even remember this conversation because you can't. Because you can't. The, the saying is you can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, it's a stupid metaphor, but it means you can't have your cake, eat it, and still have your cake. So even if you went to this world, I mean, people would be jumping off of bridges like lemmings. That was the case as soon as something got even remotely hard. So that was the case. It's like you sign the waiver. I think it's completely voluntary. And that's that's how you get in. And so it's like uh, a training it, ground. This is like a school or, or, a training or, or a school. Ground yeah. Our like, evolution, like, our spiritual evolution. It, so it sounds to me like you're almost describing kind of like a heaven realm of souls um, where we decide to incarnate. And then on the outside of the globe is basically the metaphysical realm 
That's kind of what it sounds sure. like to me. Sure, it, it is. It is. It does feel like that because the world. I, I've been trying to dice this thing up as many ways as I could, and if the world, the world can only be really only one of three things: um, either entertainment, and which can't really be because not a lot of people are having fun. Um, confinement, like a prison. But if that was the case, well, it's a really nice prison, and it's pretty you know, beautiful. It doesn't, yep, <laughs> that's very beautiful. In fact, runs really, really well without us. Mm. And um, not to steal the line from the Matrix, but it does. And uh, so it feels kind of like a balance. It feels like school. It yeah. feels like we're, we're here to learn a perspective, whatever it is. And then we go back and, and do what we're going to do. And I think, I think it's cyclical. So, and so the, the question, sorry, let me end this part with this, which is uh, people, I've heard this question many times over the years, which is if God showed up, what's the first question you would ask God? And so many people are like, why do you let bad things happen to good people? Hmm. It's like, oh, it's a stupid question. And they go, why? Because it's not a bad thing if you volunteered for it, meaning he's off the hook. Hmm. All he has to do is show you the waiver. It's like, you signed this. Yeah, like, why would you ask? You know, it's like getting on a scary ride or something. And why why do you let people be scared? It's like, well, they, they yeah. lined up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and so anyway, that's 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 what I think we are. So I, I think it's uh, so. I guess you lean, lean more towards the 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 divine, ultimately. I uh, I do, but not in not in the. I mean, I was. Uh, I'll give you a quick. I was raised born again Christian, mm -hmm. but I, when I got into tech, you know, I was did tech support and software training for years. Uh, I didn't. I fell away from that and never went to church. But getting into this, flat Earth has brought so many people back to spirituality and i say that as a general term i meaning they may not they have a different view on the ethereal you're one of your terms uh than they would otherwise and so i cannot condemn any of the five religious houses nor can i fully embrace them because i think they all have pieces to the same puzzle yeah uh, and i think i think that's deliberate seems to me though that the flat earth movement has deep roots in christianity i mean i've uh, my friend has now that is a flat earther he's he claims he is now a christian and flat earth got himself into it and i've seen lots of videos where it references the bible and to me that almost seems like that's where the agenda of this movement is it's a christian agenda no it just unfortunately it kind of that was one of the byproducts of of it and maybe byproduct isn't the right word um it's the demographics of wherever you find yourself in when you when you do flat earth. Because I've talked to people from all different religions. However, in the United States, well, you're going to run into a lot of Christians. And in England, you're going to run into a lot of Christians and so on and so on. Um, the other thing that Christianity seems to have, I wrote about this in the book. Uh, I said Christianity kind of has the, an advantage over the other four because Christianity goes over a lot of the structure of the world and if you want to get into the non-canonized books, like the Book of Enoch, but the the, the straight-up King James Bible, the reason why the, the Christian community latched onto it so quickly is because there's only one verse that even touches on, even hints at a globe. And it just uses the word circle, which I thought was interesting. And the rest of it is very, very, um, you know, hints more towards, you know, the flat snow globey model. And so they were the first ones. I mean, I... Again, I did not reach out to them, but yeah, at least 50%, at least 50% of the flat earth community is, are strong Christians. In fact, they even have conferences that I, there's been, there's been flat earth conferences. I wasn't even invited to because I wasn't Christian enough, <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> which, is, which was weird. It was like, really? I mean, seriously, unless you're, but you know, and I can do chapter and verse now, uh, but unless you can do a certain level of chapter and verse, nope, you're not invited. Right. Um, but it's but it's not but it's not agenda. It just it's just they are latching on to it way more tightly than than other than other groups because they were like, look, if their faith was already ninety percent sure, now it's like ninety seven percent sure. Right. You've given them a whole nother reason to believe in the Almighty, and they're not letting go. Yeah. Okay. Um, Accusations of you being a government agent, Mark Sargent. Where did all this start? Why? I was it... wondering when you would get to that because you actually, <laughs> it was, you were talking about the Bosnian thing and how <laughs> people get accused of being agents. Yeah. Um, most of that's political. Is that, uh, my, no, is that part... um, Math Powerlands doing? 
Is that where it all began? Not, no, not, not just Matt. There was a guy that did way more damage than him. His name was Eric Dubé. Yeah, I've heard and of him. he was, yeah, he wasn't in the documentary. Um, Matt, but Matt was one of the guys that jumped on. In fact, I've still got an email from Matt from five years ago hmm. where he said, he said, you're going to go along with what Eric and I say, or we're going to go, we're going to go after your credibility. And I said, I don't even know who you guys are. Hmm. Why are you picking on me? This is awful. He sounds like um, a but, dickhead, by the way. Math Powerland. Who? Math Powerland. Uh, sounds like an absolute Oh, yeah, yeah. He's dickhead. not He's not great. <laughs> Calling yeah, you out in yeah, math. <laughs> my, yeah, my, Matt. My flat earther well, friend, I mean, he's, you saw he's, on the flat, he's on the Math Powerland bandwagon. And when I was it, questioning him, why do you believe this stuff? He kept sending me Math Powerland videos. And my first, I just watched him. I was like, well, he's a narcissistic ego egomaniac and he's a failed actor he just likes the sound of his own voice and does dramatic monologues and then and then he's like oh he actually is an actor i'm like okay cool i mean look i don't know the guy i'm sure he's nice but he seems very combative and very uh dicky he he is a very (laughs) traditional conspiracy type guy he's from montreal canada he's very artsy um okay well, look, he is a good painter, but when he says that he... Is there any evidence of him working for NASA? Because I couldn't find any. No, no, no. As a matter of fact, I was like the first person to say... Because I knew his story. You know, you watched the documentary. Yeah. I mean, I knew his story. I could tell his story better than he could. And mm. he, thank God for us, he could never do a decent interview in his life. Mm. Um, but the thing, what I think... I think it was only partially true. Do I think the party happened with the NASA in play? Yeah, I do. Um do I think that Matt actually wor- w- got paychecks from NASA? No. I think the guy in the Hamptons, the party that he was at, I think that guy recognized that Matt was a hell of a painter. And he had Matt, because Matt, Matt was clear as telling people that he was helping paint that guy's house. Yeah. And Matt does not do short paint jobs. It's not like you're painting a wall green. He mm. goes in and yeah. paints these huge, amazing murals. And so I think it's like that degree of separation where, where it's like, okay, fine. The guy that worked for NASA was paying you to paint his house. That doesn't mean you work for NASA. Right, yeah. And But at the same time, it sounds better when he when he says it. Now, could I prove it one way or the other? No. Um, but it didn't matter because he f- just faded into the woodwork. Hmm. Um, it, it began, like the producers, and every producer I talked to, they wanted to talk to him so badly. Even, like, even the director of uh, Behind the Curve, uh, they they found him absolutely terrifying because he was just so wound up and 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 just so loud and and yet they still wouldn't you know they still to the bitter end were trying to approach him you know trying and finally they just gave gave up said you know what let's just use his youtube clips mm. without his consent screw it he can sue us yeah yeah okay so. yeah um so are you are you a government agent no <laughs> If I, if I, if I am, and anyone that spends five minutes with me should know, I mean, hell, you probably know no, that I, by the I time you're done with this. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. No, I, the, um, uh, what I try to tell people, I go, if I am, I am the, f- the greatest secret agent in the world. If I am an agent, because it's like, okay, when am I going to reveal my, my what? big, my big, my big card. And so if this government agent secret thing is true, what are you, what are you accused of peddling misinformation or bringing out the flat earthers so the government can keep an eye on them? What, what is the, oh, yeah, exactly. What's yeah. The go- I don't we, get, I can't quite get my head around. I know. Goal. I know. What, but, what, is but the goal? Me, what is the story? What's the narrative? Yeah, what killed me was, was that that rumor has, will not die. Yeah. Oh no, no. Eric Eric brought it up literally in 2015 and there Eric Dubé and he had enough followers that they would not I mean to this day I've got people that say oh yeah Mark Sargent he's obviously an agent because as you know the rumor mills rumors are powerful in the internet and it's tough tough to squash them. And so I just go the other way. I I pick you know pick up a few tricks from the movies and it's like oh no it's like no I I am the greatest secret agent. Right. Ever. right, right, right. So don't don't well, don't don't call me you know just any agent. What would if Agent Mark is uh, yeah again the narrative? What are they accusing you of doing? What how do you jeopardize the flat Earth movement? Oh, how do I jeopardize it? Yes. Well, um, if if that if what like the narrative that they're peddling? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's just it. They can't. They can only go so far because a lot of people have asked them. They say, okay, how is he hurting us? I've done, I've done more interviews. 
and this is not me being egotistical. I just, I give a decent interview. And so people just keep calling me. Um, I've done more interviews than every other flat earther combined at this stage. And I've done it on, I've done, and I don't say no to anybody. It's not like I cherry pick. I've done everything from, from kids that are in eighth grade, eighth grade newspapers, <laughs> all the way up to major networks. And, you know, I've done, I, hell, I got to go do all sorts of fun. I did, you know, did a commercial in your country, just food. Hmm. And just because we had people in sports bet that were ours. <laughs> right. That's, okay. why, that, that's yeah. how I got it. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I haven't heard anything ever. Uh, it's it's mostly not to use a, a street term, but they, they hate you because they ain't you. That's, you know? that's how that, it looks from the outside. That's it's it it's looks, mostly. But, yeah, it's yeah. mostly it's mostly ego and jealousy. Everybody, the people that want to play well with others. And we've got some great. I mean, the people that did the conferences, like everyone you saw in the um, in the film, in the documentary. I'm in contact with all of them. Hmm. You know, we're, we're all, it's a pretty close knit group. There's people on the outside that want to be in and for whatever reason, they think they can do their own thing. And the, um, the politician rules apply there, which is easier to tear people down than build yourself up. Right. So it's easier to, you know, my, you know, my opponent, he sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you say that and people, cause people don't care if you say, oh, I'm great. I'm the greatest candidate. People don't want to hear that. They want to hear the dirt. Yeah. Um, so. Mark, we, I've got a few more questions, but we've kind of come up to an hour and a half. Do you have time for a few more or do uh, you kind of want I to got, wrap it up? I got another 15 minutes. Okay, cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to get to the doco. Are you happy with how they portrayed you in that film? Me? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think they were actually fairly kind with me. Um, they went after Bob and Jaron pretty hard. Uh, Is that and they Bob took shots from at- Globebusters? Bob from Globusters, yeah. They they took cracks at him. The the director of that film hated Flat Earth. Yeah, okay. Which actually w- actually worked in our advantage. Um, but mm. yeah, he hated Flat Earth a great deal. And for not for the reason you might think though. Yeah, he was a science guy, but the reason he hated it was because of that 12-year-old kid that was asking me a question when I was on stage. Ah, that was the one thing sec- I wanted to to mention. But yeah, go on. Yeah, once that kid asked that, he I mean, I only I didn't even know. I heard this in the director's commentary. He was talking about it and he, that kid walks up and, and they said, yeah, this is when we all decided to take a stand against, against flat earth. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, you get, you know, I hung out with these guys for like seven months hmm. and uh, we did all sorts of things together. And yet that was the turning point for them. And I have to say, uh, it so shook, yeah, it shook them, me a bit. Oh, really? You, you all also didn't. Um, not because that, I guess, with my friend that I've discussed many times, I, you know, a lot of it's like, well, where's the harm? People can believe whatever they want. I mean, th- just the stories of religion are wacky enough of, you know, many of them. But yeah. uh, I think it was not just the kids, but then when I heard like third generation pulled out of school, being homeschooled by people mm. who, um, that, I think that is just the bit, like a kid believing flat earth, whatever. But uh, parents kind of pulling their kids out of the education system because, the conspiracy is so deep and you can't trust the teachers. Um, sure. That kind of worries me because I just feel like maybe those kids aren't getting, uh, they're not really thinking freely for themselves. They're being peddled a narrative that is not proven. That's not, I mean, flat no, earth is, no, no. is not proven. Um, no, no, I got you. I got you. So I just um, I worry I, whether they're not starting from the same starting point as kids of their, you know, their other kids. That was my kind of initial. Uh, no, no, you, yep. you would not be alone. You would not be alone in that in that regard. And it, what I try to tell people is that first, we, you know, we're obviously not peddling to kids. Yeah, no, uh, I get we, that. Yep. We we don't have any, you know, we don't have any special kids program. And I and I joked in the book, uh, you know, but I was mostly poking because I want to make I want to see if science could come at me. I said you don't have to worry uh, about us, you know, going after the children because we already have them. Meaning that, and by that it wasn't meant to be super sinister, although it was a great tagline which is the uh, kids as you get younger in in your demographics people are more accepting you know we believe the world that is presented to us which is why the truman show worked out so well or the the movie which they didn't talk about in the documentary um the village by m night Shyamalan, which i thought was brilliant in that you basically told these kids oh yeah by the way it's the 1800s and you're living in the woods and there's monsters the kids are going to believe you Mm. plain and simple they're going to believe what what you were told and so when you skew down to like the um, the u.gov survey, which was really, really interesting, which is done by a UK group, the 18 to 24 year olds, and it really freaked out a lot of scientists, um, were skewing a full third against the globe. 
And then if you go underneath 18, it goes even higher. It's pushing like 50%, but only if it's anonymous. Uh-huh. Meaning uh, if you, you know, you, you, you ask these kids a question and they make sure they're not in a peer group. Oh yeah, they'll answer it. But if you put them in a peer group, you know, they start to, you know, the conditioning sink, yeah. sinks in. Um, there was a wonderful one done by a video game channel um, called Asmongold where he did a straw poll just really quick. He goes, fine. He goes, you want to talk about the flat earth? Fine. Is the earth flat actually? Let's do it. And he was registering about 120 votes a second. And at no point was flat earth losing. And fi- in fact, it, it leveled out, I think, 53 to 47 flat earth to, to not flat earth. And this was a very young group of, you know, uh, of kids. And so I, I, I can't really speak for the parents, the ones that homeschool, because honestly, the ones that are doing the homeschooling are probably, they're not doing it just for flat earth. They're doing it because of all sorts of stuff. Right. They don't, they don't trust any government. And what I try to tell them is I go, make sure you teach them both. Don't yeah. just teach them flat earth. I go teach them, teach them both. And, and which is the thing that I, I throw at people, you know, even the people listening to this is, which is look, I'm not here to persuade you or, or convince you or I'm sorry, convince or persuade. I'm just here to put a couple of ideas into your head. Do your own research, figure it out for yourself. Um, I did the same thing. Nobody gets into flat earth thinking it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Everybody hates it, including me. And that was not exaggerated from the movie, which was, you know, everyone got, get into, got into it because they, they wanted to shoot it down. And in the process of shooting it down, they became, you know, it's like, all right, like me, I just gave up after nine months. It's like, all right, hmm. I'll go the other way. And here we are. Um, I've got two more questions. Uh, okay. Globusters experiments. I actually have to take my hat off to these guys because they've actually got the balls to experiment uh, the best sure. ways they know how. And, you know, it's more than just saying, well, this, this, this. They're actually buying the equipment. And um, however... I did want to talk yep. about some of the uh, experiments on the on the pro on the film behind the curve. Uh, the first yep. one was that gyroscope one, and it seemed to prove that the Earth was curved. Um, but their approach to it just seemed well, that's a problem, and just like well, that's uh, calling it a problem seems like you're already approaching the uh, data with a um, agenda. That's a problem for our movement. It's just like, well, you're not objectively looking. Another one would be the, the light experiment where they did lift up the... The, the laser. Mm-hmm. Okay, two things. Um, one, we'll, we'll do the globe or the, the Globusters one because that one, 90% of this, the people that even watched it didn't even know what the hell they were seeing, um, which is... What, so 15 degrees per hour movement. What's moving? The sky or the ground? We say it's the sky. Mainstream science says it's the ground. Which which does the the gyro detect? We don't know, honestly. Which is why they kept trying. We kept trying to shield it with, with different things. Um, in fact, we just acquired. I can tell you because I, I don't know when they're going to get well. Now with the virus, who knows? Um, they just acquired like a forty thousand dollar <laughs> gyroscope with a whole nother set of things. So they're going to try it now. The the only thing I would have changed in the movie, which leads to your last thing, which was the um. Uh, the laser, the laser test at the end. By the way, I love the fact that we were doing, we did, oh my God, at least half a dozen different laser experiments in different parts of the world. They didn't want to show them. Uh, but the big thing we use isn't even lasers, it's long distance photography, but we won't get into that right this second. Yeah, no time. But the laser so experiment about, did, but... <laughs> what? There's so much to talk about. We won't, can't, no I know, time for everything, I know. But yeah. <laughs> that, that's all right. We, we can do another one later if you want. Great, thanks. Um, so the, the laser experiment, did Jaron screw it up? Yes, he did. Did he piss off the producers? Yes, he did. Uh, was there power of editing? Oh, yeah, you bet. But did Jaron screw it up? Yeah. How did he do it? Okay, first off, the experiment was done twice, um, and they had to fly up the second time. That really ticked off the producers. Because, like, Jaron, the first time where you saw that giant laser beam that was diffused, mm. again, we had to learn by doing, and, and Jaron had to learn it, which was you don't leave the military-grade laser on. You can only leave, leave it on for, like, a minute or two tops. You just can't leave it on for th- 20 minutes, or you just blow out the condenser, and, and that's what the first one did. And so he had to get another one. But when he went back to the same spot for the second one, he, you know, it's like, wow, it doesn't look, it looks like, you know, he had to raise it up to do the curve. And it wasn't until I think like two months later, I watched Jaron doing a video where he actually drove out to the site during the daytime. And, and it was like, he, he didn't recognize it. It was like going, it's like, wow, it's like, he's never been here during the daytime. 
he never did a dry run. He had never been out to that place ever before. He thought it was flat. He never had line of sight. They never had line of sight to begin with. And, and so it's like, why are you doing the test live in front of the cameras at night when you didn't even, you couldn't, you didn't even know where the hell you were. And it was so like, he well, could have been in a flat. ditch or something. Is that what you're saying? He could yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and he hill. goes, and I go, why'd you choose that spot? And he goes, well, it looked flat on Google earth. I was going, Oh God. <laughs> it's like, so, and honestly, I did not know this until way later. And, and, and so, so and so, and I was defending him even before I found that out. So now I was like, all right. So, but did he screw it up? Oh yeah, he did. Yeah. You bet he did. So maybe but, a better way to do that would be on, on sea level, maybe like on boats. Yeah. Oh my God. There was, there was a test. A perfect example was we went out to um, Hungary. We, we sent a team out there with Guinness book world records and we shot, Oh God, like two of our guys almost died from pneumonia. This was like mm -hmm. frozen Lake. And he shot, uh, they shot 40 kilometers across this frozen Lake with a mil In fact, the military grade laser froze up and they had to use their backup mil military laser. And they shot at 40 kilometers and they hit everything great and it was wonderful. And they didn't want to talk about it. Documentary did not want to use it. They absolutely, again, I don't blame them, but here's, here's the great part about it, which was, would I have changed the ending with Jaren thing? Yeah, but it was a funny stinger ending. Yeah, It was a good, it, and, it, and it made the audience feel safe. I went to the film festivals with, um, with the teams. And in fact, they even sent me out because it did so well before it was picked up on Netflix that they sent me out alone <laughs> to things and they like made sure there were cams, you know, doing live streams so, so that I didn't go off script. Right. And the, the audience felt safe watching it. Even the title behind the curve, it's like, Oh, we can laugh at flat earthers. And, and it'd be like, it was, it wasn't pure uncut flat earth. It wasn't a propaganda piece by any stretch. So it was flat earther, flat earther, scientist, flat earther, flat earther, psychologist, flat earther, astronaut, flat earther, blah, blah, blah. And by the time it whipped you around enough to where by the time you got to the end, you had no other idea what the hell you were looking at because you were taken in so many directions. Um, 20 minutes into the film, I was sitting next to people, didn't make sure they didn't know who I was. And I was watching them the first 20, 25 minutes. They didn't even think it was real. Hmm. Literally did not think the film was real. They thought it was um, a piece of docufiction. Right. And then all of a sudden something happened on the screen and like it was getting too much. They're going, wait. I think there's something really scary on the internet and it's really big and I don't know anything about it. Um, I'll give you a quick example and, and then whatever your last question is, yep. which is, um, so this was shown, the documentary was shown to an editor friend of uh, one of the producers. They had no context. He had no idea what was going on. He showed it to him and he goes, just watch this. At the end, the guy goes, wow. He goes, what sort of budget did you have on this film? I go, what do you mean? It's like, all those actors, <laughs> they played it absolutely straight. He honestly thought that it, it was absolutely fake from beginning to end. He goes, and, and they're going, no, man. He goes, that conference happened? He yeah, goes, right. dude, we were there for three days. So, yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Um, anyway. Final question. I think this is probably the most pressing and important question that I think the audience really wants to know. And it's, okay. did that romance between you and Patricia Steele. And Patricia Steele. <laughs> into something beautiful, Mark. When I was in, it's so funny, um, because when I was in um, Auckland at a conference just recently, they were asking me, they, they asked me that. They pulled me into the studio. I was like, Mark Sargent, <laughs> you and Patricia, <laughs> what happened? It's like, oh, God. <laughs> um, Patricia's fine. Um, she's pulled away for a little while because after the documentary came out, she really couldn't go anywhere <laughs> okay. and the, tr and the trolls were merciless. I mean, the internet trolls, I mean, you know, come on, she was really pretty um, and uh, articulate and rich <laughs> and she makes YouTube videos about flat earth. What do you think it was going to happen to her? She, they mm -hmm. just descended on her. So um, she and I haven't talked in a little while, Okay, um, but she's fine. I keep tabs on her and she's down still down in Houston and she's really, really great. And, um, I got to, you know, I'm so glad we got a chance to do everything and I don't think she's gone. I'm hoping she shows up at the conference this year in Vegas. If we have a conference in Vegas, yeah, uh, of course. I, right, right now I'm not sure. Um, but, but no, Patricia's, Patricia's great. And I loved every second of, uh, of the time I spent with her. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much, Mark Sargent. There's been a, yeah. a pleasure to talk to you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And yeah. um, if if you do get the audio from this, I don't know if you recorded video and audio, mm -hmm. but either way, could you could send it to me? Absolutely. If you can. Of course, I will. Definitely. Okay. Uh, do you, um, any plugs or anything that you want to do or any kind of things that uh, the audience might want to check you out? or anything? Oh, yeah, or... yeah, 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 yeah. I, I should probably plug something. <laughs> um, uh, all you have to do if you want to find any of my stuff is go into, well, you can type in my name into Google and Flat Earth, you'll find it. Or just go into YouTube and type in Flat Earth Mark. Mm -hmm. That'll get you to my stuff. Um, I've got a decent YouTube channel, um, two books on Flat Earth, which are on Amazon, um, a pod, couple podcasts. And uh, yeah, just, you know, if you have any questions, all my contact, here's the good thing. All my contact information is on every video I have, including my physical address, my email address, my, you know, my social security number, my bank routing numbers, everything. So. <laughs> That's bold, very bold. <laughs> Well, thank you, mate. I really, really appreciate uh, you taking yeah. the time. And um, yep. yeah, hopefully one day, one day down the track, we can do a follow up. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Happy to do it. That'd be great. <laughs> All right. Thanks for All listening, right, everybody. Take care.